Let's get started. Let's dive right in. Um, I'll just tell you very quickly, I happen to have a very long association with Mercy College, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's actually kind of fascinating. My father was a rabbi, so I grew up as a child of a rabbi, which is kind of weird, but I did. And um, he went into politics. And the reason he went into politics was because Nelson Rockefeller was then governor of New York State. Had every politician has a rabbi, a priest, now an imam, and so you got to have them. If you don't have them, then you're not a good politician. And so he was involved, and then they made him Commissioner of Human Rights for the state of New York. His assistant, who was one of his biggest consultants, was Sister Etheldrida. Sister Etheldrida was one of the presidents of Mercy College. And so over the years, we were very, very close with Sister Etheldrida and her sister, who was also a sister, who was Sister Giovannis, who was head of the English department. So you can look them both up, two incredibly amazing women um, who influenced my life in very big ways. So, Let's get into it. We're going to talk about avoiding the trap of conventional wisdom. Now, why is that important to you? It's important because the world works on conventional wisdom. And the problem, though, with conventional wisdom is that whatever we talk about as disruption this morning, by the afternoon, is conventional wisdom. That's a problem. That's my quote, by the way. I don't put my name on the box because I was embarrassed. That's my quote. So, but that is, a, that is an issue. Now, what's really interesting is that I just came from my podcast. I, I, I recorded two podcasts. One was with Mindy Grossman, who is the new president, the new CEO of Weight Watchers. And you should look her up. She's incredibly, particularly the women in the room, she is a particularly, incredibly inspirational woman um, who started a career in uh, polo, went to Nike, HSN. She is an incredibly generous woman. She's named one of the 10 most powerful women in the world. She's amazing. And she was talking about this notion of disruption as well, which, is, which I'll get into in a little bit. So just hold in the back of your mind that disruption is not necessarily a good thing, but we'll get to that. But here's the thing, right? So you understand why it's important to not to follow conventional wisdom, because conventional wisdom is old immediately. And the problem with it is that we think that what's disruptive, we should be following. But the truth is, by the time we follow it, it's probably wrong. So I thought this was a great quote. Um, most people see what they expect to see, what they want to see, what they've been told to see, what conventional wisdom tells them to see, not what is right in front of them in its pristine conditions. That's the problem, right? We run after things, and you'll hear, I'm going to talk about Jeff Bezos, Jack Ma, you'll hear that they follow this wisdom themselves, right? So if nothing else, I want you to see what's right in front of you. Look to what's in front of you before you look at any place else, because that, to me, is the most important thing. You got this monitor here, I should be okay. But let me give you the knee-jerk alert. So the knee-jerk alert is I don't want anybody tweeting afterwards saying, oh my God, he doesn't believe in digital or, oh my God, he's a Luddite, or whatever. Because that's what happens in these presentations, right? Because everybody thinks that what they know, the disruption of this morning, is the real thing. So if you ever challenge it, the knee-jerk is your old-fashioned. You don't get it. You don't understand. So I always put the knee-jerk up alert, and I tell you, up front, don't go there, because you're going to be wrong. So there is no knee-jerk kid. Wait and listen and you'll see. So four things in the next 40 minutes or so. Know about principles, shattering convention, some final thoughts, and then discussion. So three principles for the evolving marketing world. So the first is it's time to get back to marketing. Right? So here's a great quote. I hardly meet anybody who says they're ad tech anymore. And tech has gone out of favor. It's old wine in a new bottle. So let's be really clear. Let's be super clear. Print was once high tech. Radio was once high tech. Television was once no, television was once high tech. Everybody with me? They were. And print was amazing. I went, you know, I grew up in the print era, and it was amazing the things that people were doing in print. It was crazy. Crazy. So all of these things were once tech. So it's time to get back to marketing. Let's stop worrying about 
what's high tech, what's disruptive. Let's just think about marketing. Think about people. So that's big message number one. Number two, people first. This is really critical. So listen to this. Despite research that demonstrates over and again that relationships are merely facilitators, some continue to reify brands and brand relationships. So reify, I didn't know what it means, so it meant, so I put it up here. Make something abstract, more concrete or real, right? So in other words, they, they, they want to take it and they want to make it real. But a strong relationship develops, but a strong relationship develops by supporting people and living their lives, not by driving brand involvement. As I like to say, it's about the people stupid. So like, let's worry a little bit less about, am I gonna make love to my toothpaste and a little bit more about is the toothpaste actually going to do something for me and why. Are you with me? So it's about, it's not, let's, let's stop worrying about the, the toothpaste, worry about me. And then if you worry about me first, because it's people first, not mobile first. I love going to meetings, people say, oh my God, it's mobile first, it's digital first. Like who knows, maybe it's telepathy first. One day it probably will be. But that's not the point. The point is about people, right? We're marketers, you're getting an MBA, right? people. That's what we do. So my mantra is digital is everything, but not everything is digital. So what does that mean? It's really simple. If you read a newspaper in a printed format, which some people still do, it comes from a digital source. Everybody get it? Chances are if you buy coffee or bagels from some little guy, you know, he's got a little butka push cart on the corner. Guy could have a square and be taking your, what you're taking your payment through some digital means. And many of them do. But that's got nothing to do with being digital. It has to mean, what it means is, it has everything to do with digital, but it's nothing to do with digital because that's just a means, it's just a mechanism. Right? We didn't say credit cards first. Right? We didn't say paper. Where does this come from? It's not about that. These are facilitators. These are things that are important, but it's not first. We still go to restaurants. We still go to movies. Events, live events have never been more popular, right? Everybody like going to live events, sports? Anybody go to the Yankee game yesterday? I didn't either. I sent my grandkids though. And so we get confused. We get confused between what's real and what's not real. So because of that, I've put up here the greatest AR experience you could ever imagine, right? So that's me having this incredible AR experience of skydiving, except it's not alternate reality, it's actual reality. I jumped out of a plane over the summer at 10,000 feet. Now, that's real. That's not AR, like I put on a set of glasses and I pretend that I was doing it or I had the experience as if I was, I opened that freaking door at 10,000 feet and went head first out of the plane. That's real. People want real experiences. So here's just a few things. And think about these things because they're true. So listen to this. Think about this. Unit sales of print books rose 3.3%. Third straight year of print growth. Now, not a lot, but books are growing. People are still buying books. Anybody been to the Amazon store yet? Shame on all of you, go. Go, go, go. If you want to get an MBA, go to the Amazon store. I'm really being serious. It's important. It's in Columbus Circle. Yeah, yeah. Go inside and experience what it is. You know why I want you to experience it? Because it's a store. <laughs> it's, it, it's a store. It's a retail store. That's what it is. And not only is it a retail store, they make you check out. You would think that it would be like the Apple store, right? Where the guys are, everybody's walking around a little square and you can just buy it in the middle. You got to go up to the cash register. And I asked them, I, I had a bunch of books. I said, oh, could you ship these for me? She goes, no, you want to ship them, go to the website. Like, carry here, we got a nice, we got a nice bag for you, take it home, you know? It's a real store. Here's another one. Angry Birds Empire, games, toys, movies, and now an IPO. Rovio returns to profit. So if you know anything about the whole Angry Birds thing, the game <laughs> started to lose money, right? It was a losing proposition. But then they start making clothes and game, you know, get clothes and books and movies, all kinds of stuff. Now all of a sudden they're profitable. It's got nothing to do with the digital side of it. 
It has to do with their brand sign. It's great. It's a brand. It's nice. Here's a great, delicious irony. BuzzFeed's old school cookbook is bestseller. So here's BuzzFeed, right, with the little videos, the little food videos. What are they called? Tasty treats or something? <laughs> Tasty treats? So they got those little things, right? They do a printed book. Get it? They're not digital. They didn't come to you. Here are the 10 things you can do. No, no, no. They did a book. They did a book. They printed it. Watches, right? I love watches because I love mechanical things. But everybody predicted the watch industry was going to go out of business. It's booming. Because people like watches. They're just nice. And people are spending money on watches. And finally, of course, music industry, growth and concert. Very important. So everybody with me? Three principles. Now let's move on. So here's shattering conventional wisdom. Wisdom number one we're going to shatter. Disrupt or be disrupted. Right? I doubt that there is an MBA school in the country, maybe in the world, that doesn't have a class in this someplace. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, I don't know. But most do. I don't want to sound like, like Trump. Yes, everybody has one. I don't know. But disrupt or be disrupted, right? And we know it's true because everybody tells us it's true, right? Digital disruption comes to you in unexpected ways. Once the disrupt has arrived, there's little chance. If your business model isn't capital D disruptive, your marketing had better be. So we know disruption is true. Except that the Silicon Valley buzzword disruption has the aftertaste of a sucked battery. Anybody here have a suck a battery? I doubt it, but I don't think it's very good. It doesn't mean anything. San Francisco tech culture is focused on solving one problem. What is my mother no longer doing for me? And the joke about that is, how many, how many, how many businesses do you think have been started to deliver same day in the past year? Probably 150, 200, maybe 300, I don't know, tons of them. So think about this. For the last century and a half, somehow Luigi's Pizza has managed to deliver the pizza hot to your house every day. And so all of a sudden, like, it's a digital thing? Give me a break, right? And so that's the problem, because we're running after stuff that's just done, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And finally, products and services are designed to disrupt market sectors. That is, bringing things to market no one really needs more than to solve actual problems. So we're not even thinking about solving problems anymore. We just look and say, okay, I'm going to disrupt same-day delivery. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to hire a bunch of people who are going to walk around with shirts that have my logo on, and they're going to deliver stuff to your house. Okay. That's disruptive? Like, give me a break. So we need to think about that. So this is my focus. I call it dissidence. So why dissidence? What's the, dis the distinction between disruption and dissidence? Dissidence is about creating a movement, right? A dissident, broadly defined, is a person who actively challenges an established doctrine, policy, or institution. When dissidents unite for a cause, they often create a dissident movement. So I want dissidents. I want people who want to get together and say, wow, there's got to be a better way. Like, I want an electric car. Because it's great. It's, more, it's better for the environment. It's easier to do whatever it is. Those are dissidents, right? They're, they're not disruptors. The company might be they're, they're dissidents. I want those people to be in my movement. So the way I look at it, no, we'll get there in a second. So how do brands live dissidents? Brands live dissidents is very simple. It's about people first. Right? Starting a movement, breaking convention. Forget about the word traditional, it's meaningless. And they have a vision to change the world. So I already <coughs> told you about BuzzFeed. That's dissidence, that's not disruption. Because they have a cookbook and they're selling, you know, the, the uh, old Foreman hot plate that they call something else now. That's not, this is not, what does that have to do with disruption? Now, people will say, oh my God, they're so disruptive because it's good for the people who own the stock. But in reality, it's got nothing to do with disruption. That's as old as you get. CVS Pharmacy, I love this. So you know that CVS stopped selling cigarettes about two years ago? Here's a, Alexander, two years ago? Their sales went down. Now their sales went back up. Because even smokers have started to go back. Why? Because even smokers, think about this. So smokers look and say, okay, I gotta go into a pharmacy. So where do you wanna go? Do you wanna go to a pharmacy that sells cigarettes that are gonna kill you, even though you're a smoker? Would you rather go to a pharmacy that has a purpose and says, I'm not selling that kind of stuff anymore? It's amazing. But that's dissidence. 
Zappos, I love Zappos, right? Anybody buy shoes from Zappos? Great. You like it? Easy, right? So do you know that Zappos wants you to call them their 800 numbers on every page on the internet? Now think about that. Everybody else doesn't want you to call them. Try to find a number to call for Amazon. Try to find an email. To email somebody on Amazon. Impossible. Like you gotta go deep, 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 deep. Zappos wants you to call them. Talk about dissidents. Everybody else, no, we disrupted the market because we don't want anybody calling us. They're going the opposite way. They say, what does that have to do with anything? We're dissidents. We want to create a movement. We want people to love us. So we're going to do it. And of course, Facebook, which I love, Facebook has a 2G Tuesday. They do this still every Tuesday, where they encourage people to develop programs for 2G. Why? Because we're all jaded. How many of you have iPhones? Raise your hands high. All right, so most of you, right? So you're all in the elite. And most of the world doesn't have iPhones. And most of the world doesn't have 4G. They got 2G. And they're sitting there with, with dumb phones, right? With just basic feature phones, SMS. And that's all they have. So Facebook gets it. And they're encouraging people to do programming around it, Facebook Lite, so that people can have functionality that's not the same as we have. So they're not jaded. Are you with me? Are you with me? So this is how I look at it. Disruptors talk to themselves. When you're disruptive, like think about it, you're a consumer. And I come along and say, I'm going to disrupt your life. Like what the hell? I don't want to be disrupted. Like help me. Why, why would you disrupt me? But disruption is a great word for Wall Street. They love it. Because somehow disruption creates money. But it doesn't necessarily create anything else. So I want dissidents, right? Because dissidents talk to, it talks to the market. It talks to people. It's about the people. It's not about the market. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Don't be disruptors. Be dissidents. Think about how you can be dissidents, how you can move things in a, in a different way. So let's look at conventional wisdom number two. Purpose drives all. Now, we heard a great presentation last night from somebody who was saying this. Purpose drives all. Companies have to be purposeful. Right? If you don't have purpose, you don't make money. And how do we know it's true? Because somebody told me it's true. So, you know, from Harvard Business Review just recently, purpose-driven companies make more money, have more engaged employees and more loyal customers, and are even better at innovation and transformational change. An organization's cultural purpose answers the critical question of who it is and why it exists very, very important so we know it's true. But, and, you know, when you look at these companies, they would agree because they have purpose in what they do. JetBlue is all about inspiring humanity in the air and on the ground. I don't get the ground part, but okay. Um, Nike, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. So if Nike married JetBlue, they bring inspiration and innovation to humanity and the athletes in the air and on the ground. So, right, but they, these guys are obsessed with purpose. And I, by the way, I happen to agree with purpose, but here's the problem. United Airlines, this is a company that has zero purpose. Zero. And look at this, right, three months after the worst <laughs> publicity you could ever imagine, their profits go up, their revenue goes up. So clearly, whoever wrote that case in the HBR didn't study this one. Here's another one, Amazon, right? Amazon has a vision. Our vision is to be Earth's most customer-centric company to build a place where people come and find this guy. That's not purpose, that's good. And again, I'm not putting them down for it, but that's not purpose like innovate, you know, inspiration, humanity, saving the world. Here's the problem, right? People almost always opt the convenience and price, even while complaining loudly about crowded planes and the dearth of amenities. So we got to balance this. We need to learn. Because you'll go to a lot of lectures and you hear a lot of people talking about, oh, you got to be a personal company. And again, I personally agree, because I think ethically and morally, we need to have purpose. Companies should have purpose. But the sad truth is, most of us will give up purpose for a better price and more convenience. And you can see it all across the world. Now, there are examples that are different. So Unilever, and I'm, I'm telling you, Unilever is not a client, so I'm, I'm very comfortable showing this. 
Unilever has purpose, right? So I think that if you're really interested, you can find this article in Bloomberg. We're going to give you these slides. You can give them out so that all of you can have copies of these slides. Um, this is a really important article to read because what's happened is Paul Pullman, who is the CEO of Unilever, has pushed back against Wall Street, and he won't do quarterly earnings or, or quarterly, um, not earnings, quarterly, um, what's the word? My mind just blanked. They'll come back to me in a second. Guidance. He won't do quarterly guidance anymore because quarterly guidance is what, what forces public companies to behave in a particular way, right? It's a very finite way of looking at, at, at their business. He's taken a much more interesting approach. And what's happened is that they get that if you have purpose, you can actually sell more product, which is fine. I mean, that's why they're in business, right? They're in business to sell product. But if they can do it with a purpose, why not? Why not do it that way? So they're, they're pretty interesting. So the takeaway is that brand purpose value must be more compelling than convenience and price. Do you understand? So in other words, if your purpose is, I'm going to inspire humanity on the ground and in the air, well, that's pretty beautiful. And then I give you $200 less on a seat on my airline, well, what are you going to do? Are you, no, I'm going to pay $200 more because I want to be inspired. I don't think so. Because there's no value in that. So the question is, what's the value in that inspiration? Like, what's the value of it? Do you see the value? Do you get any value? Does it talk to you? Is there anything about it that's interesting or that does something for your life or that you can actually see? Are you with me? So that's the issue on that. Conventional wisdom number three, TV is dead. So how do we know that? Well, again, we know it because people tell us, right? So television, well, this is great. Television actually was dead in 1948. Television won't last. It's a flash in the pan. So people have been killing television since it started. Um, Lee DeForest, I love this. So Lee DeForest was not just an inventor, but he was actually one of the fathers of modern radio. So while theoretically and technically television may be feasible, commercially and financially, it is an impossibility. And then, of course, cable TV is dying. What comes next? Obviously, this guy doesn't watch Game of Thrones. Um, live TV viewing is dying by a thousand paper cuts, et cetera, et cetera. So we know TV is dead, right? But here is the truth. The truth is it's alive and well. So if we just think about the finale of Game of Thrones' seventh season, it was a record, huge record. And it was up from the opening, which was a record. So people are still watching TV. So, but what's the problem? The problem is we talk about it the wrong way. So if we look, the analysts want to obfuscate. They, the analysts don't want you. They want you to think TV is dead because it works better for their investment model in new things. But if you really think about it, so Facebook launches a social. So this is great. This is e-week. Facebook launches social network assault on TV with Watch. Everybody know about Watch. So Watch is going to be Facebook's streaming service for video. Now I'm on the Facebook Council. So we saw these apps and we saw the things that they were doing about eight months before they launched it. So you know on your, from your Facebook you can actually stream it to a big screen, right? Now here's the thing. When we first saw it, like how many of you are just dying like you can't wait to get home so that you can put your Facebook stream on, the, on your big screen, right? None of you. But if I would give you Game of Thrones on Facebook, you'd do it in a second. And so it was clear that that's what they want to do because that is a TV. And so they get it. Facebook gets it, right? Facebook said it would expand its video advertisement monetization program. They're doing this because they get that TV is incredibly monetizable. But it's not incredibly monetizable on, that, on your smartphone. It is incredibly monetizable if I give you great content. So we all know, right, Netflix is going to spend $8 billion, they announced, mm -hmm. next year on great content. Mm -hmm. Amazon's been trying desperately. They're not getting any place with it. But I'll talk about that in a second. So that's the issue, right? So we talk about the cutting the cords and all these issues around cutting cords, right? But here's the truth. One cord costs you about $44 a month. Because if you have a cable into your home, the average person, most of you probably pay a little bit more, but the average person across the U.S. is paying about $44. And that's all in. 
right? So that's basically basic service plus. So it's giving your internet, maybe your phone, whatever. But when you cut that cord, now you got a thousand threads that are tying you to something. So the average person might have HBO Go and Hulu, Amazon Prime, Netflix, YouTube, YouTube TV, so you're paying the premium, CBS Alexis plus Wi-Fi, you're paying about $105, $125 a month. So the fallacy of this one cord thing is nonsense because you're actually paying more money going a la carte. It's just that you don't realize it. And so what everybody's hoping is that you won't realize it. The rule is so dumb because it comes in on different streams that it, you're not aggregating the cost. You're not realizing it. So my view is that what we're going to see, and by the way, we're going to see Netflix go to advertising soon. Advertising Prime is already starting to experiment with advertising. And so what's going to happen is somebody's going to come along, as they already are trying to, and re-aggregate all of this stuff. And we're going to be back to a court. Except it won't be a court. It'll be wireless. But who cares? But it's the same concept. You really need to see it, yeah. how it goes. And the joke is, this is the thing. Think about it. Back in the day when I was young, in my youth, not in Nancy's because she's much younger than I am, <laughs> maybe Dan's, um, television was in fact wireless. Like, think about that. So everybody should go back and do, the, do, do a little research, Google or Bing. I have to say Bing because Microsoft's a client, so I say Bing at least once every meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but go and, go, and, go and Google it and, and, and learn this. It's really important. Television is wireless, right? Your grandparents had like antennas and they used to stand there like this. Can you see? You know? And that's what we used to do. And you'd take a piece of tin foil and you'd like roll it across your, your house to try to get a better picture. And then all of a sudden came cable. And wow, this is unbelievable. I got a real picture. And I can go from channel to channel and it's not fuzzy. It's amazing. And then I got my, wi my, my wireless, which we didn't call wireless, came through the cable and was even better. And so now all of a sudden we think that this is new, wireless. Wow, this is great. Meanwhile, Vios is all about cable. Google is laying cable all over the place because fiber optic is the best way to get anything. That's why Vios has the fastest internet speeds because it comes through the, through the fiber optic. So anyways, this is an interesting dilemma. I'm not quite sure where it's going to end up, but it's worth thinking about. So here's the takeaway. The takeaway is that the narrow definition of TV is what I call digibabble. So digibabble is my personal term for anything that is associated with digital it's bullshit that it makes digital seem like it's some magic as opposed to something serious and and important which in fact it is so you know we live in a world where every device is a television which is true so everything is a tv so if you think that tv is just that thing up on the wall that you watch abc on and it's old-fashioned like, you're dead. You're wrong. It's not what it is. And it's not what anybody thinks. So the way that I think about it is if you ask the younger people, they tell you they're watching TV. And if you really think about it, who has an iPhone? Open up your iPhone. Tell me, look at the, what's the, what's the icon look like for video? Old-fashioned TV, right? There you go. So I always say, learn from Apple because they're smarter than most of us, right? They understand it. So what do they call that thing? A phone. What do they call this thing? A watch. A watch. <coughs> what do they call their thing that gets you to watch all that video? Apple TV, right? So just think about that. And then think about all the other people who are, well, it's not really a watch. It's a wearable. That, um, that, give me a break. <laughs> you know, they get it. All right, conventional wisdom number four. Let's chatter some more. Amazon's retail initiatives are the height of digital thinking. So I'm not talking about Amazon's technology. I'm talking about their retail is the height of... So if you read the analysts, they'll tell you, oh my God, you know, Prime is a brilliant digital invention. So let's take a look. Sears, 1890. 
It is the policy of our house to supply the consumer everything on which we can save him money, goods that can be delivered at your door anywhere in the U.S. for less than they can be procured from your local dealer. Amazon mission. Our vision is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. I would posit that this is word for word the exact same mission set. Word for word. Now, it doesn't mean Sears is right. And it, it's, it just is, because that's what they do. Now, Sears, in its day, was probably way more disruptive than Amazon was, but we don't like to admit that. So think about it. You lived, 1890, you're living in the American Midwest. You're living in a sod hut that's half underground. It's winter. Your nearest neighbor is 15 miles away. The snow is up to the roof. It's probably about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, right? It's dark already. It's cold, but inside your little side house, which probably stunk, it's like warm and kind of cozy. And you're sitting there with your family. And you know what you're doing? You're reading the Sears Wish Book. Everybody should look this up. The Sears Wish Book was yay thick. It had these beautiful little illustrations. They were really beautiful. And a lot of copy. And they used to read it to each other. They would read it out loud. And they would dream about the stuff that they were going to get when the thaw came. And then they would rip the page out and they'd paste it on the wall. They'd paste it, you know, whatever. They'd put it on the wall of the little side hut. And it would sit there. That was their art. And then came the spring thaw and the big box would come from Sears. Big wooden crates, you know. And they would take it and they'd be so excited because they'd get their stuff. And then they would take the wood from the crates, and they used to make fences and outhouses. I mean, this is famous to talk about sustainability. And then Sears got really smart and figured out, well, you know, if David bought something and he could convince Nancy and Dan, who lived 15 miles down the road, who had never bought from Sears to buy, he got a free plow. So I was the first, you know, bring a friend and get a free gift. And go. Amazing, right? You with me? So not, this is not new. This has nothing to do with digital. So while Amazon tells us about drones, Flipkart, which is an Indian company, is working with Dabawalas. Now, if you don't know what a Dabawala is, look it up because it's really interesting. So basically, the Dabawalas deliver food in Mumbai. Now, how do they deliver food? In Mumbai, if you know anything about the traffic there, it's like horrendous. So people, if you have to be working at 9 o'clock in the, in the morning, you leave your house at 5 o'clock or 4.30. Otherwise, there's no way to get there. Now, people like hot food. They like a hot lunch. That's what they do. It's a hot climate. They like a hot lunch, typically. There's a problem. In the factories, if you've ever seen what a factory looks like in Mumbai, trust me, you don't want to eat that food. They want to eat home-cooked food. But if they take f food from home at 430, by the time they eat, it's not going to be warm. So the Dabawalas have this incredibly complex algorithmic system that they don't know is called an algorithm because it's all with little color-coded pieces of paper because most of them are illiterate. That allows them to go to these people's homes, get the hot meal that their wife provides, and deliver it to them still hot and kind for lunch. And they do thousands of these every day in Mumbai. It's unbelievable. So Flipkart says, the hell do I need drones for? I got Dabawalas, they're way better. And so that's what they're thinking about. So think about it. How do you really solve a business problem instead of sleight of hand? And I'll talk about the sleight of hand in a second. And of course, Amazon opens instant pickup points in U.S. brick and mortar. So I love this. So think about it, right? Think about all of the, think about all of the things, all of the innovations that have happened that are supposedly good for you. As you go to an ATM, it's easy, right? How many of you have been inside a bank in the past? 10 days? Really? Like talking to a, a teller? Oh, no. No, I don't mean getting an ATM. I mean, how many of you have been inside talking to a teller? Really? Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. All right, so it's usually less, but fine. But think about the ATM. We love it, right? But every time you go to the ATM, you take costs out of the bank system. You understand? You're taking costs out of their system. They don't pay you. They should pay you. Every time you go to the ATM, you should get 10 cents, 
20 cents, whatever it is. Instead, they often charge you if you go to a different bank. But you've taken cost out of their system. You go to a teller, at the, you go to the kiosk at the airport to get your tickets. You've taken cost out of their system. They should give you an upgrade. They don't give you anything, but they fooled us because they told us, no, this is great for you. It's more efficient, more effective. So it's the same thing. So now Amazon <laughs> is making it sure we'll give you same day delivery instant. Come pick it up. Yeah, sure, great. Well, do you understand what you've just done for Amazon? You have just increased their profitability at zero benefit to you. Because if you have Prime, they'll deliver it for free. But now you're going to have to go schlep it yourself, and they're not giving you any benefit. So think about that next time you think about that this is a digital thing. And the most important thing is, and all of you check this next time you order, look for this box, because I love this box. So you have Prime, right? So, you know, I can have it delivered for free, which is the second option, which is pretty funny. I can get it by Friday, which is probably tomorrow, for $16 pretty expensive or six business days free and I get a reward so you understand what they're doing they don't want you to get it for free they don't want you to do prime because they lose money every time you choose free prime delivery they lose a lot of money they're trying to push it because the five dollar reward you get costs them nothing because chances are you won't redeem it half the people won't redeem it Half of the people will redeem it, but then they'll buy $5 more. So on a margin basis, it probably ends up a wash. No, in this case, they'll just give it to you. It goes into your Prime account, and then you can put it against your next purchase. Do you pay the Prime? Do you pay yeah, yearly? so you're paying Prime. Prime. Yeah, 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 but it doesn't come off your Prime. It just comes off something you buy. And, and again, only off of certain things because it's a reward. So you got to buy that right thing. So anyway, the point being that they're just scamming you, basically. But they're not. I mean, it's just retail. It's a good retail thing. And of course, the race is on because if you think about it, you know, between Amazon and Walmart, look at the difference in prices. So it's getting closer and closer and closer. So Amazon is better in some, but Walmart is way better in some. And so it's not, it's not a, a done deal yet. Who's going to win? Because this is really the race. The race is who can sell it to you cheapest and actually make money. So Amazon's not making money yet. Certainly not on this. So the takeaway, and this is what I was talking about before. Listen to this one carefully. If we can keep our competitors focused on us while we stay focused on the customer, ultimately, we'll turn out all right. So listen to what Jeff Bezos is saying. Jeff Bezos is saying, hey, companies out there, all my competitors, watch this, drones. Look up here, drones. That's how I'm going to deliver. You watching me? Drones. Don't, don't look here. Drones, up here. Follow me. And then Jeff goes and he opens up stores <laughs> over here. Think about it. That's what he's saying. Drones, follow this. Everybody goes to drones. He knows it's you're not delivering a tube of toothpaste with a drone. He opens up stores. Now, it doesn't mean digital is wrong. Again, knee-jerk alert. It just means that you have to think differently. You have to open your head to how people are doing business because one doesn't kill the other necessarily. So conventional wisdom number six. Some of you might know this. It's a famous quote supposedly from John Wanamaker. I say it is from him. Who knows? Half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. So anybody who grew up in the business knows that quote. We've always used it. And when we were on the direct marketing side of the business, that was our favorite quote. Half the money I spent, I was wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. So that was from the 20th century. Except from the 21st century, what are we saying? Half an advertiser's budget is wasted. But no one knows which half. Digital ads were supposed to help. So they're not. So we've got the same problem. In the 21st century, we're in, you know, quarter of the way through already, almost, and we don't know which half is wasted still. Like, think about that. What's going on? And so, when you think about all these algorithms, like, what's, why aren't they delivering the way they're supposed to? 
And yet, more than 250 brands have reportedly frozen all their campaigns with Google. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars was pulled. Why? Because all of a sudden, what they're discovering is that this great targeting thing that was supposed to help the half that was wasted, so now my blades for Gillette are next to, you know, ISIS beheading somebody. And like, I don't know that's the best place for my blades to be, right? Like, who wants to be there? Or, you know, BMW next to chemical attacks. These are not, if you were buying old-fashioned media, you would never allow that. Like, you don't want that to happen. So the algorithm, which is supposed to get you one-to-one, -one, just isn't working the way it should. And the same with results, right? So you're supposed to be the most result-oriented, and yet P&G raised the call to arms by describing the digital advertising supply chain as murky at best and fraudulent at worst meaning that they don't know where their advertising is going. They don't have a clue. So here we are in the age of transparency, the age of digital, the age of tracking, the age of meat, yada, 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 and none of it seems to work. So here's the takeaway. Just be smarter. It's not such genius here. Chase had ads, this is one of our clients, 400,000 sites. When that whole scandal broke about the fake news and whatever, they went down to 5,000 sites and actually less. And you know that they have the same and better results. So think about that. The algorithm, right, which is the algor algorithmic programmatic buying, which is how this stuff works, right? So you know how it works in the background. I'm sure you've all, you've all read about it or learned about it because there's an auction going on in microsecond time. And so when you go to HuffPost or whoever, and you know sometimes how your page is frozen there and, you watch the shitty ads kind of filling in the thing. That's because the algorithm is fighting in the background who gets the ad. Because there's seven or eight or 10 or 12 different companies who are fighting over your data to serve you an ad. And whoever gets it for the best price gets it. So everybody wants to get it for the cheapest price. They want to get it. The publisher wants it for the best price. Chase, 400,000 sites down to 5,000. That means that every minute, they were, their ads were on 400,000 sites. 50% of money is wasted, I don't know which half. 40,000 to 5,000 is a little more than half. Even my bad math can figure that one out. Think about that, right? Okay, conventional wisdom number seven. Millennials, right, we love millennials, right? The world, you guys, right? Millennials, <laughs> millennials, most important thing in the world. By the way, there's an article in the New York Times. Everybody should Google it. It was two days ago. Two days ago about millennials. Well, actually, about boomers. Read it. It's very important. So in just the last few weeks, all these articles ran about millennials. You know you have, what you need to know about millennials. Everyone's telling why millennials are the next tourism frontier. Millennials, everything is about millennials. You don't have millennials, you can't make any money. But you got to refocus, right? The obsession with millennials won't survive 2017 because it has totally outlived its usefulness. Now, why is that? Because A, millennials aren't exactly who we say they are. So I think this is great, right? 53% of millennials in the United States visited a library at least once in 2016, more than any other generation. Right? So why? Because books are expensive, but they like to see books and they like old books. And some people just like to do some research in books because it's interesting. They also appreciate libraries, free community spaces and in-person programming because libraries still do live stuff. I go every once in a while to for you. If you haven't been, it's great. Great lectures, interesting exhibits. So when you think about it, and plus it's free Wi-Fi. But when you think about it, it's the experience of being there. It's pretty cool. So it might sound old fashioned, but they're still going, right? So it's not exactly the way we say they are. So the truth, though, is that there's less wealth, more debt, and there's way less of you than there are of me. So way more boomers than there are millennials. And we're also a bit older, we've been working longer, so we have more income to spend. Boomers between the age of 50 and 69 have enormous spending power. And not only are they not visible in advertising, they often feel ignored. 
So if you're a marketer and you're just going millennial, 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 you might be losing a big chunk of the people who could buy. And I'm not saying don't go after millennials, that would be stupid. It's just don't forget about the boomers, right? And so the more things change, I love this one. This is from the New York Times, August 23rd, 1976, the year I started working. New York Magazine published The Me Decade, a cover story by Tom Wolfe that eviscerated baby boomers as the most ludicrous, self-absorbed, and spoiled generation in the history of mankind. <laughs> now here's what millennials are. Millennials, the me, 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 me generation. I'm about to do what old people have done to our history. Call us younger than me, lazy, entitled, selfish, and shallow. But I have studies, statistics, quotes. Unlike my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, I have proof. So in other words, we're all miserable people, right? <laughs> what can I tell you? Millennials are no better than boomers. Boomers are no better than anybody else. So what we believe in is this notion of generation world, which is really important. This is a study that we did. China, Brazil, US, so developed, sort of developed, and developing. So this is the key. 55% of people aged 18 to 64 see themselves as ageless. Age does not define who they are. So they don't see themselves as boomers, as disease. They, they don't see themselves as anything. They just see themselves as people. And what they do is not about their age. So for my 64th birthday, I jumped out of an airplane, right? That's fine. Not because I was 18 or 19 or 20 or 30. I did it because I wanted to, because age doesn't define me. It's not who I am. 53% still say their identity is involvement, is evolving. I'm a work in progress. I'm empowered. I'm mobile. Makes no difference what your age is. These are values that people have. People believe in these values. So as generation world, we think it's important. So some final thoughts, and then we'll get to the questions. Key thought. Are you a marketer? Or are you a digitaler? Listen carefully. Are you a marketer? Or are you a digitaler? So are you thinking about marketing, meaning people first, or are you a marketer? digital first. Trust me, it gets you to two different places. Are you a digitaler or are you a marketer? So this is great. Ace Matrix, big ad tech company. If you could run an ad and reach a million people or run a targeted ad to reach 5,000, you have to have pretty impressive returns on that 5,000 to make it worth it. Because the truth is, it's probably the same 50% is wasted. But if I'm wasting my 50% on 5,000, and I'm wasting my 50% on a million, like, which is a better number? Where, where am I going to get better results? Think about it. So this is another one from MIT, when a beer brand wanted to hit calorie conscious men aged 21 to 27, Adobe, and everybody knows Adobe, right? Tested the tactics and showed the client that perhaps it was looking through the wrong goggles to gauge success. By making its ad campaign less targeted, the brand lowered the cost of each ad impression and in the end sold more beer. It doesn't mean you don't make it targeted. We've been targeting ads forever. Right? It's, it's nonsense to think we haven't. It's just we can do it better today. We have better data. We have more access to data. But sometimes we over-target. And that's what they're talking about. So are you a marketer or are you digital? Are you thinking about selling your product? Are you thinking about people? Or are you just thinking about being digital for the sake of being digital, because that's the mistake. This is an important one, this is my boss. What happens if I say to Alexa, I like Cheerios, and Alexa says, I've got Kellogg's Corn Flakes, which are 10% off. Like, think about that, that's really important. So what saves you in that, who has an idea? What saves you in that? Only one thing, power of what? Money? Well, no, because I'm giving you 10% off. So this is terrible competition. I just said, maybe I'll give you 20% off. What's going to save you? Only one thing. Your brand. The only thing that's going to save you is if you think Cheerios, I have created such a great brand, and all the things I told you before, my brand value, purpose, whatever, is way higher than the, than the 
price and convenience of getting 10% off and getting another product. If you can't, and by the way, this is not new. This is a history of product that goes back to when he, you know Adam or Eve gave Adam the apple. Right? And so transactions have always been the same. If you get it cheaper and easier, unless you have a better proposition, you're going to take the cheaper easier. Same thing. So it's brand. If you make your brand powerful, people are going to say, "Thanks a lot, Alex. I appreciate it." But like, just send me the freaking Cheerios and you know give the cornflakes to somebody else. So it's a power of brand, it's marketing. Don't be more digital than digital. So I don't know if you've seen these, but these are the ads that Amazon is running all over television. And that Warby Parker runs all over television. And that Google runs all over so nobody likes talking about it because it sort of takes away from the, the notion that the analysts have that, that only, they only do digital. But when Amazon and Google are running big ad campaigns on traditional quote-unquote morning news shows, I got to ask myself why. I think it'd be foolish not to. So again, the question is, why would I be more digital than a digital company? I just want to ask the question why. I don't want to take the approach, it's, oh my God, television is dead, we're not going to be on TV. Like, ask yourself, why is Amazon there? Clearly, they have more digital channels than anybody else. Clearly, how many people bought on Amazon today? Today? Raise your hands high. Today. In the last two days. Last three days. <laughs> so, you're on there enough that if they told you to do stuff, you know, you'd think you would do it, but no, they're on TV. Again, it doesn't mean they're not going to be in digital channels. Again, knee-jerk alert. That's not what I'm saying. But ask yourself why. So here's the holy trinity. Creativity, innovation, and technology. And here's how I look at it. Very simple. This is my language, nobody else's. Creativity, because we use these terms really weirdly, and we, we interchange them in very, very strange ways. So, creativity is all about the story, right? That's never going to change. There's a reason that people read the Bible and the Quran thousands of years after they were written. There's a reason that people read Shakespeare. There's a reason that people read Harry Potter, because great stories are timeless. There's also a reason that everything else goes away and you don't remember it. Like 99% of the best sellers that everybody's crazy about, nobody's going to remember them for two years. But I guarantee you 100 years from now, people are going to be reading Harry Potter the same way they'll still be reading Shakespeare. The same way, by the way, that they still read the Iliad and the Odyssey and whatever else. Creativity is the story. It's never going to change. So when we talk about creativity, we talk about how do I create stories around my brands, my products, my service, whatever. Innovation is how I drive that story. Facebook is an innovation. Facebook is not a technology. There's a ton written about this. I've written a lot about this in the past few weeks. Facebook, Google, these are, they're not, they're, they're innovations. It's how we get the story out. Without your story, without the creativity, they're nothing, zero. They're just software loops, right? But you put a story in there and it's powerful powerful. So that's innovation. So we have creativity and we put the creativity into these innovations. It drives it. But technology is really the game changer because technology is the enabler. So technology is what enables me within that story that is now going to you through that innovation. It allows me to do something. It allows me to interact. It allows me to buy. It allows me to look at myself and see how my glasses look on me without trying them on. It allows me to size myself. It's a company called um, Penn's Kids Company. M, M something. It's a shirt company. It's really cool. I just tried it because I was curious. You put your phone on the floor and it tells you how far back to stand. And, you know, you, you stand in your underwear and it measures you. And it measures you literally, like, incredible. It's, it's wild, actually. 
how accurate it is because of the way their, their algorithm works. So everybody see this? Creativity is about the story. This is, again, this just relates to marketing. Create the story, it's never going to change. Innovation constantly changes. Constantly. So print was once an innovation. Radio was an innovation. Television was an innovation. And technology is the enabler. Technology is what allows us to do incredible things within there that we weren't able to do before. So quick recap. You want to be digitalers or marketers. Is your brand ready for number one on Amazon? Not because you've done something brilliantly digitally, but because you're a smart marketer. You understand how Amazon works. Think about how they work. Don't think about, don't listen to anyone else. Are you people first? Keep challenging conventional wisdom. Be a dissident. And remember, digital is everything. But not everything is digital. So you can all go here. That's where you can get the, um, the whole thing downloaded. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much.